Greetings, and welcome to Productive Discourse. Productive Discourse is a conversation where we talk about the positive activities that are taking place within our community. In other words, we're constantly searching for our shining needle of common ground in that haystack of fear. Today, I'm pleased to say that we're starting a new series. We're starting a series on the legends that got their starts on the baseball fields, football fields, and basketball courts of the city of Oakland. We're talking about people that took what I call the three E's, energy, enthusiasm, and excellence from the city of Oakland into the pros where they won championships. Many were elected to their sports halls of fame, and then they served their communities. Today, our guest is Richard Griffin Jr., a graduate from Fremont High School who went on to play ball at City College of San Francisco. He took his passion for baseball into umpiring where he served the game by traveling far and wide to officiate baseball games. He's also been in the Department of Labor Job Corps where he was a residential supervisor. He recently retired from that job. Griff spent 20 years with the East Lake YMCA and was an associate scout for the Texas Rangers from 1986 to 1992. Griff, welcome to Productive Discourse. Uh, thanks a lot, Steve. Appreciate you having me here, buddy. That, that's great. We've known each other many, many years, and it's going to be fun to talk about uh, the days when we were growing up and some of the experiences we've had. Absolutely, man. We go way back, and uh, great to talk about sports and be here on a Saturday morning with you and, and discuss what I love, my passion for sports in the city of Oakland. That's terrific. Well, first of all, it's been a crazy couple of years. Can you tell us how you're doing? Um, what are you doing to stay happy and healthy? Yeah, man, good question here. Uh, you know, the pandemic hit right after I retired. I retired in October of 19, and by the time March came around of 20, you know, we're, you know, in seclusion and in and quarantine, you know, at staying at home. So what I pretty much did, what I'm doing now is, you know, exercising, walking. Matter of fact, Steve, it's really helped me because I've changed my eating habits. You know, I learned how to eat better. I've uh, got more exercise in. My morning and evening prayers are done regularly because I'm at home. And uh, my whole life has changed. I've lost 40 pounds, you know, you. through the pandemic. And usually yeah. it would be just the opposite, being stuck in the house and eating. But I've taken it to another level and it's been a benefit for me. So, you know, it's been a tough time because I haven't been able to go to the ball games like I wanted to or the umpiring. I got back in the umpiring after I retired and, and that umpired like 13 games. It was wiped away that first season. But, you know, so it's been crazy. It's been good. It's pros and cons. But overall, I'm making the best of the situation. Good, good. A lot of it's how you make it. A lot of it's mindset. And I'm, I'm glad you and your family are doing well. Absolutely. We're doing great. Yeah. So you're one that got your start. Uh, in on the Oakland playgrounds. Tell us about your experiences growing up around sports and playing ball uh, in Oakland oh. and at Fremont High. Yeah, Oakland, man. You know, it all started. I grew up in the Merrill's District, Merrill's Elementary School on 53rd Avenue in Oakland. And mm -hmm. our house is right across the street from the school ground. We grew up right across the street from the playground. So going over there and playing strikeout and baseball, that's all we did. Everybody in the neighborhood would get together on Saturday mornings or any time we got a chance. We have games. If it's just three people, we close right field and center field had a three-on-three -three game. You know, it's just baseball, baseball, baseball. But my father would always listen to baseball games on the radio. So I grew up with Russ Hodges and Lon Simmons, you know, before the A's even came here. And he would listen to these games, and I just really had a passion just to hear Russ Hodges say, bye-bye, baby. You know, that was something great to me, you know, and Lon Simmons as well. Willie Mays. I saw Willie Mays, and that just grabbed my heart. And when I saw Juan Marichal pitch, I was like, whoa, you know, I was, I, I was hooked. I was addicted to baseball. And then some nights you go sit out in the car at night. I walk outside on a summer night. My dad would be sitting in the car. And I said, what is he doing out here at night? And he would have it on KFI. And you heard Vince Gully say the toe-toe patch, you know, and I was like, oh my gosh, you listen to the Dodgers? And you in and out when you really can hear it, but he was there listening to the Dodger game. So baseball, and my grandfather, Mr. Tone, man, he was a Dodger fan. Mm. And my dad was a Giants fan. So those Friday nights over grandparents' house, looking at the Giants and Dodgers and listening to my grandpa Tone 
cuss at that TV, man. It was just priceless. And I was hooked on baseball like the age of six, seven years old. Mm-hmm. Six or seven years old. So then growing up in the hood in Oakland, you know, we had some great ball players in that neighborhood, you know? And the guys were their teenagers and they're already hitting the ball all over the fences. And I wanted to play with these guys. And I was a little kid, a little scrub, and they say, Oh man, no, you go to right field, you know, maybe play in right field, you know. And uh, but I'd come up and I'll hit and I'll play with them, and I got better as we went along. And they started letting me play a little shortstop here and there. If I make a mistake, they'll kick me in the pants and say, Go to right field, a little jump, you know. So we grew up hard like that. But the strikeout game, what the kids don't know about today, playing strikeout, put that square on that wall, and we got them rubber balls. I had a friend named Ruben Silva, his father, Mr. Silva. He ended up pitching for St. Louis High himself. But we got a knock on his door, and he just always, we called him Rubber Ruben because he had a bunch of rubber balls. <laughs> he had rubber balls all the time. And I just knocked on his door at evening after dinner or something on a summer evening, and just be him and I at the school ground. Just battling in a game of strikeout, you know, and he'll bing you sometimes, you'll get mad when you hit him. And we really went at it, man. So uh, baseball was is a passion. It was at the school ground. That's where it started, Merrill School Ground. Now, his father was a coach. So when I was 11 years old, he put me on this team called McKee's Drugs in the Oakland Young America Baseball League. I wasn't pitching, man. You know, he didn't have me pitching. I played left field. But I could catch anything. I always could catch. But I was a little skinny kid. I wouldn't have much weight or anything. So I didn't have problem hitting. I could bunt good, and I could just punch a little through the right field. But I was a good little ball player, and he liked having me on his team. So I played, and he would take me over to Pacific High School during the week and teach me how to hit more, throw balls to me and get me to the game. So it was it was a great – I had some great people in my life that, that, that assisted me. But the guys in the neighborhood, they were so goofy, lily. These names are ironic. May they rest in peace. But these guys were outstanding ball players. They didn't even play high school ball. I had a friend named Dexter Cole that can hit the ball anywhere. No one ever heard of him. You know, he killed the ball, but he never played high school ball. Lloyd Gaston. These guys were outstanding ball players. Sydney played third base. I grew up with these guys. I mean, we played every day. Gloveman could play, you know, but they never went anywhere. They didn't want to play. So growing up in Oakland, you play the game, but you always had to go through the struggles of the hood. You know, mm-hmm. these guys play ball, but they were into I was a good kid, but they were into a lot of other things. Mm-hmm. So my thing was, you know, I, I wanted to be their friend. You know, I wanted to be their friend. Sometimes we hung out, did some things I wasn't not proud of. But I stayed away from most of the time. But the baseball aspect of it, man, let me tell you, I grew up in a baseball neighborhood. The Greens, Doug Green, Robert Green, Glenn Green, they all end up playing ball at Fremont High School as well. Uh, Willard White. Greg Armstrong. These guys all grew up in the hood, man. And they all became outstanding ball players in high school. And someone went on to college, you know. And I mean, the names go on and on. Yeah. Well, you went on to college and at City College of San Francisco. How did the great competition you had in high school and before high school help you when you played uh, community college ball? Okay, well, you know, I had a tough ride coming to Steve. When I got thir- when I came 13 years old, I pitched no hitter when I was 12 years old. By really? the time I was 13, I couldn't even find a team to play for. Harry Harris, who coached the Bay Roof Baseball in Oakland, he cut me. Hmm. So when I was 13 years old, I didn't have a team to play for, man. So I just played strong out at the school ground and didn't have a team to play for. I went to Hamilton Junior High School and a, a league called the Free- Fruitvale American Little League. They had a senior division. They had signs up there. You can join. 14, 15, too, 13 to 15 year olds. So me and about 12 guys, all our friends, walked up to Fruitvale Field for the tryout camp. And they had a draft. And all my friends got picked by the Oakland police team. Mm-hmm. And I was the only one who got picked by Kessler's accounts. That league right there is what got me going. My team won a championship and my skills developed there on the mound and left field and third base. So that led to me being a good high school player too because I ended up pitching all-star games. Mm-hmm. You know, like shutouts in the All-Star game. It did very well. So all of a sudden, I was at another level. So when I went to high school, Fremont, you know, I, the intramural game, I was like, woo, I was throwing the ball right by everybody, and I immediately made the varsity team there too. But he still had me play some JV games. And I, I pitched a no-hitter in San Francisco in my sophomore year, you know, mm-hmm. Balboa High School. So all that led to me. But it didn't go smooth in high school, Steve. My junior year, I didn't play that much because I got hurt. And my senior year, believe it or not, I started playing semi-pro ball when I was 16. And I had a job. Semi-pro? 
Yeah, because I, I worked at Naval Air Station. I had to get a job, you know. In those days, you got to work, you know. So right, right. I didn't get to play ball in the American Legion or Senior Bay Group or anything. So I was already working at Naval Air Station every day in Alameda. So uh, my friend said, you can play senior. I said, with them grown men, I've been watching these leagues for years. You know, because that's how I started, too, going to Lincoln Park, watching the semi pro games on Sundays. Mm -hmm. I never knew I'd be playing against these same guys at the age of 16 years old, you know. <laughs> so... That's what my path was. I didn't, in my senior year in high school, I quit. I didn't play my senior year all the way. Because hmm. I was mad at Alamano, rest in peace, great coach. But he wouldn't pitch me against Oakland Tech. I wanted to pitch against Ricky Henderson. I'm so bad. And he didn't pitch me that game. And I just wanted to play. I always just wanted to play. I wanted to be on the field. I didn't care about all the other stuff. So I quit. And that Sunday, I pitched a nine-inning game at Golden Gate Park in San Francisco to see my pro. And uh, and I stayed to see my pro and didn't play my senior year in high school. So I have any didn't have any offers. Yeah, I didn't make all city. I didn't do anything, even though I had some great moments. I didn't do much in high school. So that first year out of high school, I didn't go to school to play anywhere. Right. There was a guy, a storyteller named Cousin Walsh. He happens to be my father-in-law. His son is married to my sister, Cousin Walsh. And he said, he looked, he sat down with me and he looked at me and said, you're not doing anything, son. I heard you could play baseball. But why aren't you playing? Why aren't you in school? And I looked at him. I said, I don't know. You know, he said, go to school. He had his son drive me over to San Francisco, man. And I went to City College and I told the coach, hey, my name is Richard Griffin. I'm a baseball player. Even though I hadn't played no school ball in two years, you know. He said, you get a tryout. Come out and try out at Balboa Park, you know. And uh, he got me, got my tickets and got me signed up to class and everything. And from there on, I, I had some great games at City College. I made the team, man. And uh, and I led the team in wins and saves my, sophomore, my freshman year. Wins and saves, good. Yeah. Both, yeah. So... I did very well over there, but then my sophomore year, I had an incident where my sister Jean was shot to death in Oakland, oh. and, I, and I went home and never came back. Mm -hmm. I never played my sophomore I never played back again. That's why I started working with kids and started doing other things, but I went to City College because of Cousin Walsh, you know, oh. Mr. Hunt, you know, so it was, a, it was a struggle. I mean, it wasn't smooth for me. I didn't have a, I didn't have a mentor to really tell me what was right and what's wrong, because you weren't supposed to quit high school baseball, you know? Mm -hmm. But I did that, but, you know, I had enough goal, enough, I knew I had the ability, but, you know, once I got to 15, 16, 17 years old and started working, the passion for baseball was still there, Steve, but I didn't work at it as much because I was working a job, you know, mm -hmm. so it took away from it. But I always had that ability to throw that big old Griff curveball. They call me curveball Griff. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So you talked about... Um, some of the guys that grew up and they didn't want to, they didn't want to play on teams, but they were great ball players. Uh, who are some of you? Our generation was, you know, Ricky Henderson and Dave Stewart about the same age as us. Yes. Did you cross paths with them? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Ricky. Matter of fact, I spent time with Ricky and your good friend Harry Rogers. We all I introduced him to Ricky. Yeah. A whole other story there up in Ogden, Utah. But Dave Stewart played for St. Liz High. Right, you know, and that that's when I pitched one of my best games ever against St. Liz in my junior year before you know before I got injured. Mm -hmm. I, had, I had nine strikeouts like in four innings, but they oh. had a great they had a great team. They had Stewart, Andre Collins who played for St. Mary's College, uh, Champ Richmond who played for St. Mary's College. All, these guys all signed, you know, and David Manzuela. I mean, they had a great club. Ricky Henderson, Fred Atkins, Lloyd Mosby. I played against all these guys in high school and, you know, great ball players and Lloyd Mosby and Gary Pettis. And I mean, we going on Steve Moore who signed with the Mets. These, we all came up in the same generation, Johnny Cook. Uh, that era of baseball was so strong, so strong. But you know, when you play ball with these guys, you didn't realize what you were into. You know, I didn't know it was such a great era. I just love baseball. Right. So, and so I competed with these guys all the time. And I would run it like Tack Wilson, Michael Wilhite from Oakland High, Cliff Weary, Benny Hobbs, all outstanding ball players. Michael Wilhite ended up breaking all the Lou Gehrig records at Columbus. At you know, Columbia? Yeah, at Columbia. Okay. And, and he was the center fitter for Oakland High back in the days, you know. And I pitched, had great games against Oakland High. I, I mean, I pitched good against them. But I see those guys later on at night sometimes when we're at a party or something. The first thing they ask me is, who signed you, Griff? And I said, I didn't get drafted, dude. But you guys did, so good luck to you. And But 
Gerald Price. I don't know if you remember that name. He was the first pick overall in the entire draft. Really? He went on to play with Diablo Valley and then went to USC, played with Mobile Cox, you played with Ricky Henderson at Tech. These guys were ball players. And I told Mobile Cox, you know, he ended up coaching Bay Bay Ruth baseball in Oakland and helping the kids as well. Cause he signed, I think, with the Padres, I believe. Or might have been the Mariners out of UCLA. Mm -hmm. He was the first pitcher at Bush Rock Park that ever heard the ball sizzle when he threw his fastball. You can hear, and I told him, I think the first time I heard a ball sizzle like that when he threw a fastball. Outstanding athletes, man. So yeah, I crossed paths with all these guys, and some of them were still main friends. But Steve, the biggest input I had was from the old Negro League players. Mm -hmm. When I first started playing see my pro ball, and Harry Rogers can attest to this, I had a catcher named Ernie Applewhite. He was like 32 years old playing see my pro ball because he already played in the Negro Leagues. And I was a 16-year-old pitcher. But he he tutored me, he taught me how to pitch. You know, Bobby Jones, Harry Carr, names you don't hear about. I got to see Oscar Matthews, rest in peace. Oscar Matthews played baseball, LeVere's coach. Big Sam Scott, signed with the A's later. Cruz is catcher. Uh, I mean, the semi pro leagues that was going on in those days in the Bay Area, you know, Rudy May pitched in those leagues. Mm -hmm. You know, Dennis Eckersley, Tom Candiotti, you know. And I got to pitch against like the minor league all stars when I was 16 years old at Washington Park in Alameda. But they had see my pros big those days. So every Sunday you can go to a park at a Royal Park in Oakland, Bushrod Park in Oakland, Lincoln Park in Alameda, Washington Park in Alameda, or San Leandro Ballpark, or San Pablo Park in Berkeley, and you're gonna see a see my pro baseball game. You know, so I played for the regional post office, the Oakland Pirates, and the Berkeley Stars in see my pro baseball. Great leagues. So was it the fact that there were so many teams? I mean, when you're kids, it's Young America and the Police League. And right. high school ball. as you get a little bit older, or in your case, you were only 16 years old, it's it's semi-pro. There are just so many teams that it makes for great competition and it just, the, the cream rises to the top. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you got even Alameda had a team, the Alameda Islanders, and they had some sluggers from Alameda back in those days, Reagan and all those guys, you know. Even these guys can really hit, you know. And uh, you know, so many teams, man, is and a lot of talent didn't make it. You know, you know, a lot of guys that can really some of the best ball players I've ever seen in my life. I played with a guy named Donnie Thomas at Fremont High School, who later on played for a Chabot and with a high draft pick for the Yankees and played running back for the Washington Huskies as well. Wow, okay. He was the best athlete I've ever seen in my life. Man. Rest in peace, Donnie. You know, he's my teammate, plays my pro with us as well. Guys like this, people don't know are Oakland legends that were outstanding athletes. And when I went to Donnie's funeral and I spoke to the people regarding Donnie, I said, I played with Rupert, I played against Rupert Jones, Claude L, and Ricky Henderson, Mosby, Gary Pettis. I had never seen nobody quite like Donnie. And people were like, they're like, whoa, wait a minute, what do you mean? They not really heard of him, you know, but see, if you saw him, you know what I'm talking about. And I think, uh, you know, people that played with him in that era, they know what I'm talking about. Donnie Thomas, one of the best athletes in Oakland that ever came through here, a three-port sport star that was just a great baseball player and probably the best running back to come out of here as well. The best running back. That says a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, so, yeah, I crossed paths with many, many of the ball players. you know, uh, through the CMI Pro League, through the high school, and through the junior college. You know, I got to play against Dave Rigetti and, and Jay Seaball, you know, Willie McGee, Gerald Price himself, the Dabla Valley, Cliff Weary, you know, some good ball players. The Golden Gate Conference was pretty tough them days, you know, in the late 70s, early late 70s. Yeah, we had some ball players coming up. So all the players that came up as a player, I crossed paths with many of them, like Hall of Famer Ricky Henderson, you know, and Dave Stewart. I, I think he's a Hall of Famer too. We're still, you know, I went to Ricky Henderson's Hall of Fame party and saw Big Dave there. And he, you know, Dave hugged me so hard. And he was like, oh, Chris, you know. And it was like, Dave Stewart was a catcher then, you know. Dave Stewart was a catcher. He didn't really pitch much. And the old scout named Eddie Jewell. I don't know if you heard of Eddie Jewell, but he had an old scout in that area back in those days. Like me, he was an associate scout. Mm -hmm. So he was in the area a lot. So everybody knew him. And he, did, I think he didn't want to discover Big Dave and got him signed with the Dodgers, you know. But, uh. Yeah, I crossed paths with many of them. Your friend Rogers, the same way, you know, he's, you know Rogers doing the 90s. That's another guy that we don't, you know, take a, a good look at. But 
he was he he struck out some of these guys I mentioned that he threw the ball by. Yeah. <laughs> you know what he, I mean? In 1979, Harry and a couple of other guys and I went to a random A's game. That was when they before Billy Martin came. That was when they were really bad, and they might have had 1,300 people at that game. Right. So we're 21, 22 years old, and we're just roaming around the stadium before the game starts, and we're right behind the A's dugout. Nobody's there. It's just the four of us. Right. And a head pops out, and this guy shakes hands with Harry. And Harry, hey, how you doing? And it was Ricky. Yeah, yeah. And we Harry knew who he was because, like you said, they hung out at Ogden. Yeah. But, uh, it was Ricky. He had just been called up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a great story. Yeah. Because Harry pitched batting practice to him out in Ogden, Utah. Oh, really? And, and I shared this story with uh, Ricky, too. Because yeah, uh, we first went out there. I said, I got some friends out there. And I go out there. Pat Gentry. Remember Pat? Pat Gentry. We're, yeah. You were visiting him. And then they said, the Ogden A's, let's just go watch. You know, I think Ricky's out here. And Ray Cozy. Ray Cozy is his roommate, too. And he played. He used to work out with us at City College because he's from San Francisco. And the A's had signed him. He made it to the big leagues for a little bit, too. But Ricky had me throwing batting practice to him for a while. Then he let me hit some, too. And then he, Rogers got on the mound, too, and started throwing BP to Rick. Rick was like a ball player. He was there. The game started at 7. He had us out there. It was like 3 in the afternoon in a hot odd and heat. We had us out there throwing. But he was trying to make it, man. Yeah. And Harry, so I told, <laughs> I told the story to Rick at, at a Fred Atkins 50th birthday party. I said, man, remember Harry throwing batting practice to you? You hitting them line drive. You got the screen out there, but Big Rod's want to stick his head out and look, and Rick hit him in the head with a line drive. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he probably remember Harry very well. And I, Ricky cracked up. I said, why do you use the screen? Why Harry stick his head out there looking at you? <laughs> Rick hit the line drive off Harry's head, man. He had to get carried him out of there, man. Oh, we, and so we, we spent time in Rick's apartment, him and Ray Cole's apartment at night. So we got to know him pretty good then, you know. So that's probably that's that experience you say I can relate to it very well because I know they knew each other <laughs> from that great experience we had in Ogden, Utah. Yeah, well, that's good. That, <laughs> it's just so many stories. <laughs> so you talked about uh, getting advice to go to City College of San, San Francisco, yeah. and there was the Police League, Young America, and the high schools. Who are the adult role models? You had. Oh, yeah, man. Jesse Wyatt, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Butler from KTVU, the Bay Roof coaches. Oh. Uh, you know, uh, Eddie Jewell from the, that that pro part of the uh, baseball world. But you had some great guys. Harry Harris, who cut me, but he was still a role model, you know. Uh, Brenda Knight from the Oakland Bay Roof program did some great things in Oakland for kids. You know, but my, the people that really modeled for me, it was a guy named James Dice. Call him DeWitt. Mm -hmm. He D -Witt. played baseball for Fremont High Beef way before, like in the late 60s. But he played American Legion ball. He was a role model for me, for sure. And he let me be bat boy for his team when they played at Chabot College and stuff like that. He played in the Legion ball, you know. So I didn't get a chance to play in the Bay Roof Leagues. My little brother, Glenn, did. Mm -hmm. That's why I met Jesse Wyatt and Mr. Butler and all those guys. My people I, in the Fruitvale American Little League was Ken Cravallo, you know, uh, Mr. Clark. Uh, let me see who else was it. We had some great guys. Oh, Jesse from uh, Casper Hot Dog Team. We had some great players in that league, too, that Fruitvale American Little League. No one knows about it. But we had an all-star run where it was like a couple of games from going to the Little League Senior Division World Series, you know. And, but so no one knew league, about that league. Little, little league, league American. Senior, li yeah, Fru Fruitvale American Little Fruitvale League. Fruitvale American. Yes, yeah. yeah, senior division. That's the 13 to 15 year olds because I didn't get to play Bay Root. Hmm. And I played in that league. But I made the all stars. And we got all these guys together the Willard White, Terry Johnson, Victor Gonzalez, Renee Pena, who was Ricky's catcher in high school for tech. He was my catcher in the all stars then. We, uh, man, it was James Martin who went all city for Fremont, uh, Kevin Murray. I mean, some great guys, man. And we got together as this kid from Oakland, and we went out to Hayward and stuff. And, man, they, they were surprised what we can do. See, Steve, I've been playing strikeout on the ground and pitching at Greenman Field and these little parks. They didn't even have a mound. Yeah. And I had this curveball, and I threw it, you know. And it would break at the school ground. 
I was at Hayward High School with 72 pitching in the All-Stars. And it was a mound. I had never been on a mound like that. So when I followed through my curveball and started coming down like that when I came off that hill, I was in shock myself. You know, everybody, <laughs> everybody's like, everybody's like, wow, look at you. Man, I, it was a seven inning no, shutout, you know, like, you know, it was, it was nice. Walk two, strike out about seven or eight. But the, the Ken Cravalo gave me that opportunity right there to pitch, you know. And then there was a guy named Bill who coached City Dodge baseball. He the first player pitch a coach to ever give me a chance to pitch, you know. So these guys, you know, they're the role models. You know, a guy named Coach Aaron I had at Merrill's who would just cuss at me because he wanted me to improve on my game, you know. And he had me out there so late hitting ground balls to me. My sister come call me for dinner, and he had me out there to hitting ground balls to my sister. I had my sister crying. Leave him alone. I'm working with him. You know, he was like a bully, but he was a good man. He was a mentor. But see, guys like this dissipated all of a sudden. And that's what got me into working with young people. Yeah, that's the, that was the next thing I was going to ask. It sounds like they were the people that planted the seed for you to say, you know what, I've got something to give to the youth. Absolutely, right. Steven. And once I left City College and, uh, and I went back to Merrill School Ground, there was nothing there anymore. Mm -hmm. The kids had nowhere to go. There was the, the playground was closed. There were no directors working with the kids. So I, I spoke to the kids. I said, what do you guys do? You know, we, we want to play baseball. I said, what are you playing? There's no one's here. I walked to the YMCA because I've been there when I was a kid. And I asked the people in that building, what are you guys doing for the kids in this community? I just quiet and threw straight out asking. Mm -hmm. He said, well, we got a gym. I said, what about baseball? No, we don't do any of that stuff. I said, I want to get it going here. And the guy looked at me and said, can you do that? I said, I can certainly try. You know, so I... Walked the neighborhoods and the Merrill School let me speak to those kids in an assembly. And I got most of my ball players, mostly Latin Americans, but Mexican guys, you know, some some brothers, some black guys. But they're kids that nobody else wanted on their teams. Mm -hmm. I took those kids. I took these kids. And they became excellent, excellent ball players just by just telling them you can do this, basic fundamentals, make the routine play. Go to school, <laughs> go to school. All the mistakes I made and from my mentors I had, I used that experience to help these kids with, you know, not to have the same pitfalls that I had, right. you know. And I felt good about that. I remember telling my mother, she said, what are you going to do now? You're out of college, you know. You're, what are you, what are you, I'm going to work with kids. And she looked at me like, you never, <laughs> she couldn't imagine me doing this. But that's what I did. I started on every program at the YMCA. I, I started on my own. I started the baseball teams. I had two teams. I had a team from 10 to 12 year old and a 13 to 15 year old team. I did the, the I got the sponsors for the team. I got the uniforms for the team. And then I paid, I got to make sure they got the admission fee to the leagues. And uh, I got some guys that volunteered to help me coach. You know, Terry James was not my stepson. <laughs> you know, yeah. I got him into coaching. And, uh, a couple of players from that program got drafted. This is a great story here, uh, Steve. Ron Reens played for me as a 14-year-old kid. And uh, by the time he was 17, 18, he had become a pretty good ball player as well. But he had never really – he was raw. His father, Leroy Reams, had played pro baseball, but he was raw. Pat Bayless, Jose Altamirano, these kids were good little ball players. But I was, my first draft pick was a kid that I coached at the Y. It's nothing like calling a kid on the phone on draft night. They didn't know I scouted. I didn't tell I didn't know what I did. You know, they know I umpired baseball. I was gone a lot. And I come back to the Y. And I was doing a lot those days. I was umpiring, I was scouting, and I was working with these kids. So I gave up my life <laughs> just for the youth at that age. You know, I was all dedicated to youth. And uh, this is a great story. I called this home on draft night because the Rangers called me and said, hey, we got your guy. That's your guy. You call him. That's your pick. You know, so I called Ron Reams. His mother answers the phone. And I said, this is Rich Griffin, you know, from the Texas Rangers. I said, from the Texas Rangers? Rich, you're not with the... I said, listen. <laughs> I said, ma'am, I just want to let you know your son Ron has been drafted by the Texas Rangers. who received receive his telegram in the mail. And she just burst out crying. Oh, that's my baby. She started crying. So I say, well, tell Ron, is, he wasn't there at the time. I said, make sure he didn't understand the telegram would be in the mail. That's how I worked at them days. In them days. Uh... Then she said, why you never said that? We knew you didn't know you do anything, did anything like that. And, and Ron, you know, when you're scouting, those days, you you know, you were parking in front of a kid's house and, see, you know, check out their character and what time they come in at night, you know, check them out off the field. And, you know, Ron would see me sometimes. Rich, what you doing in this neighborhood? You know, 
coach, what you doing? I said, no, I got a friend across the street and stuff. But I didn't know you lived around here. Actually, I did. You know, and he would sit and talk for a while and stuff. He really didn't even really know. So when he got drafted by the Rangers, and I mean, I can remember Ray Luce who coached Berkovich, and they, everybody said, how did Ron Reed get drafted? But he said, it was that rich Griffin guy, you know, Ray. I hope you're enjoying this conversation as much as Griff and I are. This is the end of part one. We'll continue with part two next week. So come back, and I hope you join us. If you'd like to know more about Productive Discourse, please go to productivediscourse.home.blog. It gives you great information about our activities and how you can contact me if you'd like me to speak at your service club, community organization, religious group, or your Toastmasters club. So join us next week for part two of the interview with Rich, Richard Griffin, Jr. But in the meantime, please like, share, comment, subscribe, so this message will go far and wide, and we'll find that shiny needle of common ground in that haystack of fear.